Welcome, Martin Kramer. Happy to have you with us. Welcome to all of you tuning in from whatever countries um, you're looking in from. It's a great pleasure to have you with us. Uh, Martin Kramer is a highly uh, distinguished historian of the Middle East and Israel. He splits his time between Israel and the United States. Twice a year, he's in Washington, D.C. at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, where he is the Walter P. Stern Fellow. Uh, he was the founding president of Shalem College, a liberal arts college in Jerusalem, which has been uh, thriving in recent years, thanks to the hard work of Martin and his many colleagues there. He's also been a visiting professor or visiting fellow at a number of American universities, including Brandeis, the universities of Chicago, Cornell, Georgetown, Harvard, Johns Hopkins. He's also been at the Wilson Center in DC as, as well. His own studies, both as an undergraduate student and a graduate student, were at Princeton University. It was at Princeton where Bernard Lewis, the preeminent scholar of uh, Islam and Middle Eastern history, taught for many years. And Martin Kramer did his PhD under uh, Bernard Lewis there. Um, among his own many publications on Islam, Israel, and the Middle East, I call your attention in particular to the very widely discussed and influential book, Ivory Towers on the Sand, The Failure of Middle Eastern Studies in America. That could take a lecture by itself. You're not going to hear much about that today. Uh, it's now my great pleasure, Martin, to hand over to you. Um, we'll all listen in keenly to what you have to tell us about Bernard Lewis and his own highly influential book, Semites and Anti-Semites. Thank you, uh, Gunter. Thank you, Alvin, for that introduction. Let me begin with uh, the ritual of the screen share. And we'll hope that the uh, technology doesn't disappoint us. There we go. Mm -hmm. And uh, there you see yours truly with uh, Bernard Lewis. Um, one moment, let me straighten out some things here. Well, uh, when, um, when Alvin asked me to contribute to this series, uh, I hesitated for a moment. I'm not a researcher of anti-Semitism. Uh, I'm a historian of the Middle East, uh, but as Alvin indicated, I was also a student and a friend of Bernard Lewis. Uh, Lewis too was a historian of the Middle East, but at one point he became an important and an influential interpreter of anti-Semitism. So frankly, my motive here isn't so much to understand anti-Semitism as it is to understand Lewis, to grasp why he departed from his scholarly path uh, to descend into the grim, this grim netherworld of research into hatred of the Jews. Now to remind you, uh, Lewis specialized in the history of the Middle East, the Arabs, uh, the Turks, the Persians, and of Islamic civilization more broadly. He was born in 1916 in London, and had a distinguished career at the University of London. At the age of 60, he relocated to Princeton, uh, to the university and to the Institute for Advanced Study. Uh, 60 isn't young, but Lewis was blessed with vitality and good health and with a genetic predisposition to longevity. Uh, and over the next 30 plus years, he became America's leading interpreter of the Middle East. Always, always a prolific author. He published even more in retirement. After 9-11, Lewis wrote two, two New York Times bestsellers. Uh, he was in his mid-80s at the time. 
He published his memoirs at age 96, and he died in 2018, just shy of his 102nd birthday. Now, during this very long career, uh, Lewis gained fame among many and notoriety among some for his interpretations of Islam generally and the modern Middle East uh, specifically. He was a historian's historian, but he also was a master of elegant and very approachable English prose uh, that reflected his genius for language. It was demonstrated also by a very rare mastery of Arabic, Turkish, Persian, and Hebrew. His hobby was to translate poetry from all four languages. He once told an interviewer that his abiding interest and specialty was Islam as a civilization. Over, over many years, his primary scholarly interest remained fairly constant. Islam in its many permutations and the attempts of modern Muslims to come to grips with modernity. But Lewis was also a Jew. When I first met him in Princeton in 1976, this aspect of his identity hadn't figured much in his choice of research topics. But once he established himself in America, Lewis felt inspired or liberated to turn to Jewish and Jewish related subjects. His two most significant works in this area appeared close to each other. Uh, in 1984, he published The Jews of Islam, a study of the Jews in the Islamic world from the seventh century to the present. Uh, and in 1986, he published Semites and Anti-Semites, an ambitious and far ranging work that analyzed anti-Semitism historically with an emphasis on its growth among the Arabs. Uh, the erudition on display in this book was remarkable and demonstrated Lewis's unique talent for moving effortlessly between the history of the West and of the East and across the whole chronological range of world history. Now, why did Lewis write these two books? and especially the second. Many of the people I've known who in a certain generation, his generation wrote most extensively about anti-Semitism had been its victims. Uh, historians like Saul, uh, Shaul Friedlander, uh, Walter LeCur. Um, <clears throat> so did Lewis suffer from anti-Semitism? Perhaps as its victim, he wished to better understand it. Well, there's something to uncover here, but in an unexpected place. Lewis was a child of British born parents. So he was second generation British. And in no account did he ever reckon with anti-Semitic bigotry in his native country. Although of course in the 1930s, when he was a young boy, uh, there was still plenty of it. If anything, he regarded Britain uh, to be more removed from anti-Semitism than any other country, even America fell short by his measure. And in his memoirs, he wrote this, and I quote him. On my early visits to the United States, this would have been the 1950s, I was shocked by the level of institutionalized anti-Semitism, which would have been inconceivable in England. It was quite uh, normal at that time for some hotels not to accept Jewish guests. In England, any hotel that did that would have lost its license. End of quote. Now, in Lewis's wartime military service, he'd been entrusted with the most sensitive work a Jew could do. He served in British intelligence, and toward the end, in 1944, one of his duties was to translate from intercepted Hebrew communications of the Jewish agency in Palestine. Uh, in Britain, only Jews had the requisite knowledge of everyday Hebrew to do this task, uh, but could British Jews be trusted not to leak the fact of the intercepts to the Zionists? Um, the Arabist, James Hayworth Dunn, said no, and he secretly denounced Lewis as a Zionist to MI6. In response, the head of MI6, Robert Menzies, famously known as C, uh, rushed to Lewis's defense. There had been no leaks, he said, and he dismissed Hayworth Dunn as, and I quote him, a very tainted source of information. He has an Egyptian wife and is known to be violently anti-Semitic, end of quote. So when Lewis stood accused of disloyalty by an anti-Semite, the British establishment stood by him. 
In later years, Lewis would always regard himself as accepted and trusted by the British establishment from the Foreign Office to Chatham House. France was another matter. Uh, in 1936, Lewis went to Paris to study under the French Islamic scholar Louis Massignon. Uh, Massignon, he wrote, and I quote him, had two prejudices against me. Sometimes I was not quite sure what my offense was. Was it crucifying Jesus as a Jew or burning Joan of Arc as an Englishman? End of quote. Um, but of course, Massignon was not uh, who admitted to struggling with his Christian anti-Semitism. Uh, uh, wasn't the sum of French scholarship. And in later years, Lewis earned genuine admiration in France where he collected uh, accolades and honors. So not Britain and not France, but that brings us to an unexpected place. Lewis's real brush with anti-Semitism and the most significant one came not in any Western country, but in the Arab world in 1949. Now, after the war, Lewis uh, became a full-fledged historian of the Arabs. Indeed, Lewis was almost the only true historian of the Arabs in the West at the time. The others were all philologists or orientalists. In 1946 and 47, he wrote this book, The Arabs in History, a slim volume which would become a classic when it appeared in 1950, later went through countless editions. It figures on every syllabus of a certain era. Um, and now Lewis had traveled and researched in the Arab world, specifically in Syria uh, before the war. And no doubt he imagined that he would resume exploring the Arab world after the war. But it wasn't to be, because after 1948, he was barred from entering Arab countries as a Jew. This is how he related it, and I quote him. Arab governments made it quite clear that people of the Jewish religion, no matter what their citizenship, would not be given visas or be permitted to enter any independent Arab country. As directed against Jews, this ban was seen as perfectly natural and normal. In some countries, it even continues to this day, although in practice, most Arab countries have given it up. Neither the United Nations nor the public protested any of this in any way. So it is hardly surprising that Arab governments concluded that they had a license for this sort of action and worse. End of quote. Now, of course, one could lie about one's religion and some did, but Lewis didn't think this an option. And I quote him again, most of us, even the non-religious found it morally impossible to make such compromises for no better reason than the pursuit of an academic career. Imagine, if you will, a young scholar of China banned from China, or of India excluded from India, or of Russia barred from Russia, not because of a political stance, but due to his or her ethno-religious identity. Lewis's non-Jewish colleagues could and did travel anywhere they please, but not Lewis. At 33, he was already a full professor, but he faced a threat to his research career because of institutionalized Arab bigotry and no one seemed to care. Lewis would famously compensate. Turkey, although Muslim, was open to Jews. So he learned Ottoman Turkish. He went to Istanbul in 1949 and he became the first Westerner to work in the Ottoman archives. Lewis said it was as though he had been let loose in Ali Baba's cave. Since the Ottomans had ruled the Arabs for 400 years, he could write Arab history from the Ottoman records. And this was his breakout work, and it made him both unique and famous in his field. But the fact remained that he'd been a victim of Arab prejudice against Jews. And it was, it was more than that. I mentioned that during his wartime service, he'd been involved in translation from Hebrew. But that was only at the very end of the war as the conflict between Britain and the leadership of the Yeshuv loomed. For most of the war, he translated intercepted communications from Arab governments. The British, of course, were worried about possible collaboration of the Arabs with the Nazis. What Lewis had helped to uncover was a swamp of pro-Nazi sympathy stretching from Iraq to, to, uh, to Egypt. And this gave him firsthand insight in the ways racist ideas of European origin had penetrated the Arab world. 
and it had a sobering effect on a young man who taken up the study of the Arabs out of enthusiasm. And this I submit is the background to understanding Lewis's two works, the Jews of Islam, and even more so Semites and anti-Semites. They're an attempt to reconcile his conflicted feelings about Muslim attitudes towards Jews, so tolerant when Islam was powerful and so hostile in his own lifetime. The thesis of the Jews of Islam is that Muslims in their heyday generally tolerated Jews as people of the book and often preferred them to Christians who sometimes sympathized with hostile Christian powers. Now tolerance, Lewis pointed out, wasn't equality by any stretch. Jews could never be equals of Muslims in an Islamic polity that would have amounted to the dereliction of Islam, which um, inscribes the supremacy of Muslims in, in countless ways. The dhimma, the uh, covenant that governed Muslim Christian relations was codified discrimination. But this didn't amount to institutionalized hatred. The Muslim view of Jews was that they deserved contempt for being physically weak, cowardly, unmilitary. And this is a common prejudice against the other in many times and places. And Lewis regarded it as unexceptional in the Middle Ages. Muslim contempt was much more benign than the Christian fear that attached to Jews in medieval Europe, uh, that the Jews were a sinister force for evil. As Lewis emphasized the Jews experience in Islam compared favorably with their experience in Christendom, even in much of modern Europe where a virulent anti-Semitism led to their near extermination. So what went wrong? When the Arabs discovered that the Jews weren't as contemptible and cowardly as they thought, they rushed to embrace the idea of a powerful Jewish kebab. They borrowed that idea off the shelf from the Nazis and then the Soviets, turning the Arab world into the hotbed of anti-Semitism that it became in his time and in our time. Lewis also dealt with a common objection to his analysis. Uh, the title Semites and Anti-Semites is an obvious allusion to the claim, sometimes made by Arabs, that they can't be anti-Semites because they're Semites themselves. Lewis definitely demolishes this in three chapters devoted to definitions. There's a chapter called Semites, another called Jews, and a third called Anti-Semites. <clears throat> um, by the end of these chapters, we've learned that it was in Europe which constructed the pseudoscientific category of Semites. We've learned how irrelevant it is to any understanding of the Jews as a religious group or an end of people. And finally, we've learned of how Jew haters turned the bogus Semites into a racial category. Those enemies, when they say, when they said Semite really meant Jew, not as a people or a religious group, but as an inferior race. So what first originated in religious prejudice became a murderous racial doctrine, anti-Semitism directed exclusively at Jews. And that's why the Nazis had no problem collaborating with Arabs. It's interesting at this point to consider Lewis's definition of anti-Semitism. Um, his approach wasn't legal or bureaucratic, but historical and semantic. Lewis was a concert pianist with words. He never wasted words, he never stumbled over words never misused words. And while he taught Westerners the deeper meaning of words in Arabic, Persian, Turkish, and Hebrew, he also taught us uh, the deeper meaning of words in English. Lewis would latch onto a loaded term, uncover its origins, track its evolutions, and then he would define it for present use, always with an exact precision. And anti-Semitism was just such a term. <clears throat> Lewis believed it should be defined with precision on the basis of a logical distinction. Its definition shouldn't wander, and it should exclude more than it, than it includes. Uh, let us watch him in this clip do precisely that with the term uh, anti-Semitism. Persecute Jews without being anti-Semitic. That strikes you as nonsense. It isn't. What I mean is this, hating people who are different, persecuting people who are different, even on occasion massacring people who are different, is part of the normal human condition. We find it all through history. We find it in every part of the world, in every civilization. Antisemitism is distinct 
in that it attributes to the victim, to the Jews, a kind of quality of cosmic evil, the like of which cannot, as far as I'm aware, be found anywhere else. In the history of Islamic civilization, Jews were variously treated. Sometimes they were fairly well treated, sometimes less well. On the whole, not too badly. But anti-Semitism in that sense was simply unknown. It did not exist. It was even explicitly refuted when attempts were made by Christian minorities in the Middle East to introduce it. We have, for example, sermons by Ottoman sultans denouncing and condemning the blood libel, saying, um, it's, worth re it's, it's, it's worth hearing the whole passage, but I wanted to emphasize this particular one because it's quint quintessential Lewis. I mean, this one clip deserves an essay. Uh, the way he sets up his audience, the way he surprises it, the way he disarms it. But style aside, and in summary, he says this, anti-Semitism is attributing cosmic evil to the Jews and nothing less than that. <clears throat> so Lewis here is repeating the old adage that I sound like someone who dislikes Jews more than is necessary. Uh, it's not the quality, the quantity of his hatred that makes him an anti-Semite, but it's quality. And so anti-Semitism isn't just a conventional prejudice. It's not even the conventional prejudice against the Jews. As he says, it exceeds and surpasses all other prejudices, as did the Holocaust that it produced. Lewis maintained that anti-Semitism was, was itself subject to constant mutation, each mutation becoming more virulent than its predecessor. Uh, the religious form, essentially anti-Judaism, could be traced to antiquity. It became especially destructive in Christian lands where the eternal or wandering Jew stood forever accused of deicide. But even this idea of a cursed people still belonged more to the category of ordinary rather than extraordinary prejudice um, because similar curses were attached to others, such as Blacks. Modern racial anti-Semitism represented a far more dangerous mutation, one that specifically targeted Jews and for which there were no precedents and thus no antibodies. The second part of Semites and anti-Semites proceeds to a nagging question. The Holocaust, many believed, and I continue my metaphor here, should have inoculated the modern world against anti-Semitism, religious or racial. The scale and the brutality of the genocide, its industrial character, its documentation through images and film delivered a shock to the conscience of the world. And yet, as Lewis showed, anti-Semitism has in fact evolved so as to survive the Holocaust, re-emerging as an obsessive hatred of the state of Israel. This was what he called the new anti-Semitism. Uh, Lewis does this in the next section of the book, composed of four chapters. The chapter Muslims and Jews is a succinct statement of the argument in the Jews of Islam, the tolerance generally shown by Islam to the Jews. The next chapter, the Nazis and the Palestine question, provides a mass of evidence of the sort that Lewis analyzed as an intelligence officer during the war, of how Nazi ideas infiltrated the Arab world. Jews were transformed from an object of traditional contempt into a focus of modern fear. Master manipulators whose plans laid out in the protocols of the elders of Zion, and you see an Arabic translation here, uh, plans were being implemented at Muslim expense. The chapter on the war against Zionism shows how anti-Zionism emerged as an almost inevitable form of resistance to the idea of a Jewish state in Palestine. But the next chapter, the war against the Jews, shows how this resistance transformed itself into an anti-Semitic juggernaut by ascribing to the Jews everywhere the qualities of cosmic evil that are the trademarks of all anti-Semitism. Soviet anti-Semitism then poured oil on the fire. Thus was a local political conflict transformed into a struggle between light and darkness. There's a grim passage in this chapter that describes the central role played by the Arab world in the post-Holocaust surge of anti-Semitism. Allow me to read it. The level of hostility and the ubiquity of its expression are rarely equaled even in the European literature of anti-Semitism, which reached this, uh, which only at a few points reached this level of fear, hate, and prejudice. 
for parallels, one has to look to the high Middle Ages, to the literature of the Spanish Inquisition, of the anti-Dreyfusards in France, the Black Hundreds in Russia, or the Nazi era in Germany." End of quote. And when one considers that Lewis draw, drew almost exclusively on Arab examples and, and didn't yet include the vast corpus emanating from Iran, the conclusion is striking indeed. A final chapter of the book, The New Antisemitism is a kind of handbook of how to distinguish between ordinary criticism of Israel and uh, an obsessive rage against the Jewish state. It's useful, I think, even today, especially on the contentious question of when and where anti-Zionism crosses the line into anti-Semitism. It's a subtle and a nuanced discussion. It's free from our present day compulsion to write a definition that's enforceable by bureaucracies, courts, and in answering the question of what constitutes good faith criticism of Israel, he touches on the core of the issue. One passage in particular draws an important line. Lewis writes that after 1948, and I quote him, the content and purpose of opposition to the Jewish state changed. To prevent the birth of such a state was one thing, to terminate it after it was born another. Some who favored contraception balked at abortion. Some who would tolerate infanticide stopped short of murder. Even in the Soviet Union, few were willing to go that far. The critics and opponents of Israel denounced its policies and sought ways of reducing its territories, but with one exception, they no longer spoke of dismantling the Jewish state or driving its inhabitants into the sea. The one exception was the Arab world and its more faithful adherents, end of quote. So on this spectrum of contraception, abortion, infanticide, and murder, uh, there is now a not negligible segment of opinion in favor of the last, disguised as the one state solution. So Lewis offers us a very potent metaphor for recognizing just how extreme that position is. Lewis ends on a surprisingly op optimistic note. Arab anti-Semitism for all its vehemence and ubiquity is quote, still something that comes from above from the leadership rather than from below, from the society, a political and a polemical weapon to be discarded if and when it is no longer required." End quote. And were these leaders to make peace with Israel, the anti-Semitic campaign could, and I quote him again, fade away and be confined as in the modern West to fringe groups and fringe regimes. Whether we're closer to this in 1922 than we were in 1986 would make a good uh, webinar debate in the future. In 2004, Gabriel Schoenfeld, in his book, The Return of Antisemitism, wrote that Lewis he may have described the situation in 1986, but from our present vantage point, appears unduly sanguine. In the streets of Jordan and Egypt, West Bank and Gaza, Jew hatred had diffused broadly and couldn't be so easily discarded by the leadership. Still, almost 20 years have passed, so the question needs to be visited, I think, yet again. The significance of Semites and anti-Semites is obvious in retrospect. Uh, over a decade earlier, uh, Lewis had written a piece entitled The Return of Islam in commentary. And within a few years, Islam had returned. Semites and anti-Semites warned against the spread of the new anti-Semitism and lo and behold, uh, it spread. Lewis didn't invent the term new anti-Semitism. His, his childhood friend, Abba Iban, used that phrase as early as 1973. But Lewis was the first to back it up systematically. Now, I've given you only a, a summation of his argument, but much uh, of the power of the book comes from its examples. The footnotes are replete with sources in Arabic and Turkish and French and German and Spanish and Italian, bringing substantiating evidence from far-flung sources. And as always too, he gave the, a readable account, shorn of polemic, subtle, understated. Lewis in his memoirs explained that he was especially cautious to appear objective. He wrote, and I quote him, in trying self-critically to preserve my scholarly impartiality, I knew I had to watch out for three sources of prejudice, the Western, the British, and the Jewish. If I'm writing on Semites and anti-Semites, then obviously it is the Jewish angle I have to look out for. It. And look out for it, he did. And this evoked admiration. The reviewer for foreign affairs, who's not Jewish, described the book as, quote, a calm and reasoned, but not neutral, discussion of a subject that rarely evokes calm and reason. 
Publishers Weekly called it clear-sighted and dispassionate. Saul Bellow noted the coolness of its scholarship, even if its inclusions, conclusions might, as he put it, engage the passions. But above all, Lewis put the subject in the mainstream. The book was published by a major house, Norton. It carried an endorsement by the former diplomat, George F. Kennan, Kennan someone uh, with uh, no particular concern for the topic. He called it, and I quote him, a powerful and important work based on a range of, uh, uh, of uh, based on a range of erudition in the best sense that few others, if any, could command. I learned a great deal from it. Many others, I am sure, will do the same. So Kennan's endorsement, <clears throat> coming from someone rightly suspected of bigotry against Jews, helped carry the book beyond Jewish readers. All these factors assured um, that the book would um, be widely reviewed. Um, it received two reviews in the New York Times, um, one during the week, one in the weekend review section. The latter included a boxed profile of Lewis. There were uh, reviews in uh, the um, Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, Christian Science Monitor, the Wilson Quarterly, and the Times Literary Supplement. A summary entitled, The New Antisemitism Appeared in the New York Review. Um, translations soon appeared, um, French, German, Italian. The book also appeared in Hebrew. It even appeared in an Arabic translation. Of course, there were critics. The simplest engaged in a rather primitive what about it. Edward Said, the most notable Palestinian critic of Zionism, admitted that, quote, yes, there is anti Semitism in the Arab world and elsewhere. But he added, why did Lewis fail to quote uh, or to mention the fantastic, as he put it, the fantastic outpouring of official religious and political literature in Israel, whose proclaimed attitude towards the Goyim is startlingly racist? What about the tradition of anti-Gentile polemic in historical Judaism? What about Rabbi Kahane, what about Dushan Manim, and so on. Said notes that Lewis is, as he put it, too delicate to do more than allude quickly to them. Uh, Rabbi Arthur Hertzberg, the gadfly critic of Israel's policies in the New York Times, did something similar, if more subtle. He said there was a missing part to the book. He thought it should have included what he called a discussion of what the Israeli Arab conflict is doing to Jews. And he added, there is a growing, growing demonology that too easily equates Arab with terrorist or potential terrorist. The Israeli Arab confrontation is not only harming the integrity of Islam, it is also evoking unlovely emotions in some part of Jewry. Uh, needless to say, the, um, <clears throat> the whataboutists had their own agendas which they thought vulnerable to Lewis's finding. So it's difficult to describe these as true critiques of what he actually wrote. In any event, Jewish attitudes towards Arabs weren't Lewis's topic, or one which, or, or, and not one to which he pretended to have any expertise. The much more interesting criticism <clears throat> came from another direction, that Semites and anti-Semites, and the Jews of Islam came before it, oversold the influence of imported anti-Semitism on the Arab and Muslim worlds. Arab anti-Semitism could be traced directly to the Islamic tradition without any need for stimulation by the Nazis or the Soviets. Now there are different versions of this critique. Some are more persuasive than others. I'll bring uh, just one because it came from one of the foremost students of anti-Semitism, the late Robert, Robert Wistrich. Uh, Wistrich, who is shown here with Lewis, <clears throat> was a professor at the Hebrew University and later author of many important books, such as Antisemitism, The Longest Hatred, and A, a Lethal Obsession. Wistrich reviewed Lewis's book for commentary. And let me just bring a few of the more trenchant sentences of his critique. And I'm quoting here. Lewis somewhat downplays the significance of the legal disabilities humiliations and persecution inherent in the protected Vimni uh, status, <clears throat> uh, status of the Jews under Islam in the pre-modern era. Lewis does tend a little too readily 
to relegate the sufferings of the non-Muslims under Islam to the category of common, conventional prejudice, or even normal prejudice. Lewis has slightly overstated the impact of Christian European influences on Arab anti-Semitism and neglected its more local and indigenous roots. The entire tradition of religious supremacy and triumphalism in Islam has profoundly shaped attitudes to Jews and Judaism. Notions of subversion, cruelty, and malevolence did not need to be brought in from the outside, neither did they require the emergence of Zionism in Israel for their articulation, and, and so on. Now, this is serious criticism. And uh, as Wistrich himself noted, Lewis's position seems, he described it as ironic, because as he wrote, few scholars are as aware as Lewis himself of the centrality of Islam in modern Arab ideologies and cultural traditions. Okay, I am not gonna take one side or another in this debate or split the difference either. Uh, that's for another day. As I said at the outset, my motive here isn't so much to understand uh, anti-Semitism as to understand Lewis. And I would submit that his interpretation complemented and reflected his own lived experience in the Middle East. That lived experience revolved around the contrast between the Turks and the Arabs. Uh, Lewis would often say that he first entered Turkey or set foot in Turkey, coming from Syria, not from the West. Why was this important? He alluded. Most judgments and evaluations, he said, are based on comparison and are inevitably shaped by the elements compared. Mine were markedly different from the usual. So the translation of that quote is this. You, coming from the West, might look down on the Turks. To me, coming from Syria, from the Arab world, the Turks look much, much better. And I often think that Lewis arrived in Istanbul in 1949, much like those Jews who'd been expelled from Spain and Portugal in the 15th century as someone seeking refuge, in his case, research refuge. The Arabs had subject, subjected Lewis to a Jewish ban, but the Turks had welcomed him. They'd opened up their most secret archives to him without regard to his Jewishness. And these welcoming Turks were Muslims, indeed within living memory. The Turks, not the Arabs, had been paragons of Islam in its Ottoman form. So no one could claim that they were less representative of Islam than the Arabs. So clearly then, for Lewis, the roots of contemporary anti-Semitism in the Middle East lay not in Islam per se, but in the specific Arab experience in our time. And since during the war, Lewis had been fixated uh, on Nazi propaganda among the Arabs and the possibilities of pro-Axis treachery, these seem to be the variables. So ultimately then, Lewis wasn't writing about Islamic anti-Semitism, but about Arab anti-Semitism. And what distinguished the Arabs was that Nazi Germany had irradiated them with propaganda, especially those places under the British thumb, such as Egypt and Palestine and Iraq. So when we read Semites and anti-Semites today, we have to do so not only through the lens of 2022, or even of 1986, but of 1942, when Rommel bore down on the Middle East. And ultimately, in 1492, when wandering Jews found shelter in a part of the Islamic world. So I conclude, uh, Semites and anti-Semites framed the debate that we continue to have. There are more data points now cutting in different directions. Uh, and I know this webinar series considers them in, in, in great detail. Unfortunately, the academy itself has become one more data point. Lewis, also foresaw the re-export of anti-Semitism from the Middle East to America. Uh, the carriers have been Arab immigrants and one main vector has been the academy. When Lewis wrote his book, there were just a few nodes, mostly in Middle Eastern studies. Now it's spread much wider and academics have become some of the leading purveyors of the idea of Israel as a cosmic evil. Uh, an American university was also a kind of refuge for Lewis at a moment of personal crisis. But much has changed since then, and the academy today is overwhelmingly hostile to his legacy. And one wonders where he would find a professorship where he miraculously reincarnated. But the shelf filled with his books cannot be silenced. 
And the only question for the student or the newcomer is which book to open first. Now, I hope I persuaded you that Semites and anti-Semites isn't a bad place to start. Thank you.